One second. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, which screen are you seeing? Oh, yeah, I need to switch again, right? Uh, Okay, 10.08, so it'll go till 11.08, got it. Okay, I'm ready. Hello, I'm Jacob Stein, and welcome to this presentation on advanced planning with trusts. I'm a big fan of trusts. Uh, there is so many ways we can use trusts for all types of planning. We use trusts for asset protection planning, for estate planning, estate tax planning, special needs planning, income tax planning, pre-immigration tax planning, right? And just taking care of our families. So in this presentation, I wanna take you through some of the more esoteric, I should say, uh, uses of trust, more advanced uses of trust. So going beyond the sort of the standard living trust. Um, I have been practicing uh, taxation, trust law, asset protection for 25 years, uh, have pretty much seen it all, done it all by now, and, and would like to share some of these, uh, not just knowledge, but some of these experiences with you as well. Um, so before we begin, I think it's uh, very important to kind of be on the same starting page, um, and we'll just cover the basics really, really Quickly, I'm sure most of you know and understand these basics, but I do want to make sure uh, we're all on the same page. And there are a couple of important nuggets here. Um, so what is a trust, right? And in its, pure, in its purest, simplest form, what is a trust? And, you know, usually like in a, in a live presentation, when I ask people the, the, this question, I get all sorts of guesses. And I think the most common one is, oh, it's a legal entity which is perhaps not a bad guess, but not a correct one. Uh, a trust is an agreement. It's, it's a private uh, contractual agreement between the set lord of the trust and the trustee of the trust. And that's very important, I think, to understand. In my opinion, that's very important to understand because if the trust is a private contractual uh, agreement, what does that mean? Well, think of, uh, think of it when you enter into any contract with another uh, private party, right? What are the limitations on how you can structure that contract? There are very, very few. There are some limitations exist, right? There, there are certain requirements that we have to create a valid contract. Um, like you have to have consideration, right? They have, they have the intention. Uh, you cannot be for an illegal purpose, but once you satisfy these basic threshold requirements, the terms of that contractual relationship can be whatever the parties agree to, right? And it is very similar with the trust agreement, right? The trust agreement also has some you know, specific uh, threshold requirements uh, that are required to create a valid trust agreement. But once you satisfy those threshold requirements, uh, you can structure your trust any way you want to, right? So why is that important? Because very often, questions will come up along the lines of, well, can we do this with the trust? Can we do that with the trust? Uh, can the trust accomplish this? Or how is, how is the tax? How is this treated? And the answer is almost always, well, that's up to us, right? It is almost up to us. Uh, you know, if it's an existing trust, does the trust allow this or that? Look at the trust agreement. Does it allow this or that? Um, if we're drafting a trust, again, it's up to us to decide how that trust will be drafted uh, and what the terms will be. And for me, that's a very liberating idea, right? We can draft we can draft trusts the same way we drafted them yesterday. We can draft trusts the same way that you know our mentors taught us to draft trust. But we can also use our creativity, use our imagination, you know, put on the thinking cap and draft them in a very, very different way. I think primarily people draft trusts 
similar to how we draft other contracts, right? To be similar to what we did yesterday, because what we did yesterday is safe. It worked. We didn't get sued for malpractice. It worked for the client, right? So it's safe to continue to do it that way, which is not a bad practice, right? We don't need to reinvent the wheel every single time, but we can do some new and exciting things if we understand that it's up to us to decide how the trust is drafted and what provisions it has. Um, another interesting thing about the trust is that just automatically by operation of law, when we transfer the ownership of an asset into a trust, we automatically split up the ownership of that asset into two separate bundles of rights. Uh, that are usually combined together. We don't think of it as being two separate bundles of rights. Um, but <clears throat> when we transfer an asset to a trust, the bundle of rights split into two. One is the legal title, right? It's one set of rights. And the other are the equitable uh, sort of beneficial interest in the asset. And that's a separate bundle of rights. And whenever an asset goes into a trust, the trustee now holds legal title and the beneficiaries of the, tri of the trust hold the equitable interests in those assets that the trust has. And, and when we say that we transfer an asset to the trust, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's often, you know, just a shorthand reference, but it's not a technically correct description uh, of what we have done. Uh, we never transfer an asset to a trust because a trust is a contract. A contract does not own assets. A contract cannot own assets, right? We say we're transferring assets to a trust, but in reality, we are transferring assets to the trustee of the trust, right? That is who's holding legal title for the benefit of the trust beneficiaries. There are four parties to the trust relationship. Well, traditionally three, most often three, but now more and more four. So the set lore is the person who is transferring assets to the trust. And that's an important distinction. So I didn't say it's the person who is setting up the trust or drafting the trust because that can be literally anyone. Anyone who transfers assets to the trust is deemed to be a settlor of the trust, right? So I can create a trust, put, it, put some assets in, I am a settlor. But if one of you takes assets and also puts them into my trust, you will also be deemed a settlor of that trust, settlor of my trust, right? And that may have certain tax consequences being deemed a settlor of a trust. There is a trustee, right? Then the, the trustee, and this is where we have a distinction from a trust as a contract versus any other contract. The trustee is a fiduciary, right? And the office of the trustee has fiduciary obligations and responsibilities. And that is somewhat something that's distinct about trusts compared to other contractual agreements, right? In other contractual agreements, we usually do not create uh, fiduciary uh, responsibilities and so forth. We have beneficiaries, right? This is who will benefit from the assets at some point in time, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe in a hundred years. And then more and more, we have what is called a protector. And this is a topic we will come back to and we'll spend some uh, you know, more meaningful time on. Um, there are a lot of different terms that are thrown uh, about trust. This is just a tiny, tiny sort of sampling of different terms. Some of these terms like marital deduction trust or exemption trust, uh, these are tax terms, right? So you will find them in the estate tax planning uh, code sections or cases or what have you, rulings. Um, some are used just by the trust drafting community in general. Uh, so very foundational terms like intravivus versus testamentary, revocable versus irrevocable. Um, and then there are some terms, and I don't have them on here, that are pure salesmanship and marketing. Um, we'll talk later if we have time about bridge trusts and fortress trusts and other uh, silly names like that. Um, and you have to recognize when a trust name has technical significance, right? So if I say something is a qualified personal residence trust, that has a technical significance in the internal revenue code. But if I say that something is a bridge trust, like what is that? Well, someone came up with some term to sell trusts, right? That, that's what that's the significance of that term. Uh, so you you have to keep that in mind. And often we will see people place so much, uh, it's actually a great degree of importance on what you call the trust. Usually it doesn't matter 
outside of the tax code. Um, let's talk a little bit about a couple of these topics because they are important. Well, really one that I want to focus on, which is this distinction between a revocable versus irrevocable. How do we know if a trust is revocable or irrevocable? Well, the easy way is to say, well, it will say so in the trust. And if it doesn't say in the trust under state law, by default, every trust is revocable. <laughs> well, I, I want you to understand what revocable versus irrevocable uh, means. Um, so revocable means that whoever transferred assets to the trust, right, the set law, right, the person transferring assets to the trust has retained the right to take their assets back from the trust. That is a trust that is revocable. So it's not the trust, we say it's a revocable trust, but it's not the trust itself that's revocable. It's the transfer of the assets to the trust that is revocable or irrevocable, right? The trust itself, maybe we can terminate it, maybe we cannot terminate it. And when we terminate a trust, what happens? When we terminate a trust, we accelerate the distribution of the trust assets to the beneficiaries of the trust. When we revoke the trust, when we revoke the transfer of assets to the trust, the assets go back to the settlers. So revoking versus terminating, two very different concepts, right? And revocable versus irrevocable, also different concepts. And irrevocable is a trust where the settlor, the person who put the assets in, has not retained the right to take his assets out. And we will come back to this on the next slide because this will have an important meaning. <laughs> Almost, um, if not all trusts that are used in the more creative planning uh, arena, uh, kind of the, the, the more sophisticated trust. Trust we use uh, for special needs planning, for asset protection planning, income and estate tax planning, uh, pre-immigration tax. I mean, all of these trusts are um, ir irrevocable trusts. And uh, when we use um, trusts for um, income tax for you know for these planning purposes and we have to make it an irrevocable trust uh there is often um there is often a difficulty for many clients and even for many practitioners right um uh, to work with an irrevocable trust because we sort of have to put ourselves into a proper mindset because of that word irrevocable right it's a scary word like none of us want to do something that is irrevocable, right? Uh, anything in life that's irrevocable is a bit scary, right? Because like, well, what if we change our mind? What if the circumstances change? What if the law changes? What if our relationship with beneficiaries or the trustee changes? We don't want to commit to an irrevocable trust. And also, once the assets are in the hands of the trustee of the irrevocable trust, how do we control those assets? Like, we want to control our assets. Like, it's one thing to get some, like, beautiful tax benefits from using the trust or asset protection benefits. But we want to retain control <clears throat> over the assets of the trust. I mean, almost all clients do. It is extremely rare that someone will say, yeah, just put them in the irrevocable trust. I don't care. It happens, but it happens very, very rarely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how to, um, how to work with irrevocable trusts and how to make them not so scary, right? So first of all, state law, and, the, and these state laws, by the way, they're based on the Uniform Trusts Act. So they're very uniform uh, from state to state, right? So this is true in most every state. State law allows for the termination of an irrevocable trust um, with or without court approval. So if the set law of the trust is still alive, you can revoke, or I should say not revoke, you should terminate a trust, not revoke, you should, you're able to terminate a trust, an irrevocable trust, without court consent, so long as the settlor is alive, and both the settlor and the beneficiaries consent. Um, and, and of course, the trustee needs to consent because the trustee is the one who's actually transferring 
the title of the assets, right? From the trust to the beneficiaries of the trust. If the settlor has passed away, then even then the an irrevocable trust may be terminated early, but now you have to go to, to probate court and get, get court approval and somehow satisfy the court that you know, the trust has served its purpose or it's in the best interest of the beneficiaries to do this, or this is what the settlor would have wanted. But what's uh, interesting is that, you know, we, we've drafted irrevocable trusts the same way for hundreds of years. Literally, you know, for hundreds of years, we've drafted, like going back to medieval England, we've drafted trusts the same way. Um, I mean, the language has changed. I like recently read an English trust from like 1940s or 50s. I could understand like maybe a third of the words that were in the trust, right? Um, so maybe the vocabulary has changed a little bit. But the substance of the trust, how it works, right, hasn't really changed that much. And certainly, certainly you know, since the time I've started practicing law and, and well before then, uh, when we had an irrevocable trust, you know, there was a specific way people drafted the irrevocable trust. And how did they make the trust irrevocable? Well, they made the trust irrevocable by saying in the trust agreement that this trust is irrevocable and it cannot be amended, right? And it cannot be terminated. So it's irrevocable. It cannot be amended. It cannot be terminated. Thank you. So every irrevocable trust somewhere in it would have a sentence to this effect. And pretty much those words, right? And then people realize that, well, we're sort of overshooting the mark. Because to have an irrevocable trust, you don't need to have this broad prohibition, right? Because if you look at the state law and the definition of what is an irrevocable trust, it's a trust where the set law does not have the right to get his assets back. What is the distinction between that? The set law does not have the right to get his assets back and saying this trust is irrevocable. Well, if you say that this trust is irrevocable, it's very broad language like that. This trust is irrevocable. Who cannot revoke it? No one can revoke it. It's irrevocable, right? So it's not just that this or cannot revoke it. No one can revoke it. That certainly overshoots the mark. And then again, why do we not have the ability to amend it? What does that have to do with the settlers right to revoke? Why can't that be terminated? What does that have to do with the right to revoke? So what the trust drafting community has realized, we have realized is that we can have a trust that will be treated as an irrevocable trust for whatever purpose we need it for. Maybe it's tax planning purpose, maybe it's asset protection, special needs, what have you, qualifying for government benefits. We can have a trust that is treated as an irrevocable trust, but why take away the right to amend it why take away the right to terminate it? As a matter of fact, why take away the right to revoke it? Because the law clearly states that the set more cannot have the right to revoke. Why can't Uncle John over there have the right to revoke? He's not the set more. What if we preserve the right to revoke in someone else? And slowly, this is uh, one of the ways that the use of trust protectors uh, came into being. So a trust protector, um, a tall, beautiful, dark stranger, um, is a new position that was created within the trust relationship. This is in addition to the trustee, a separate person from the trustee. And the trust protector is given certain very broad powers over the trust. So what are the powers that the trust protector is given? And why do we want the protector? So keep in mind why we want the protector before I tell you what the powers are, because I think that's like really important to understand. The reason why so many of our clients, I mean, almost all of our clients want the trust protector concept in their trust agreement is because that is how they retain control. It's not a direct control because if our client has direct control, then the trust will be treated as revocable. It's indirect control to, through the protector. So the protector is given the power to revoke the trust. What does that mean? Oh, return the assets back to the settlor, not to the trust protector, right? 
is revoking it for the benefit of the support. The assets go back to the support uh, to terminate the trust, right? Meaning terminate it early, and then the assets go to the beneficiaries early. Uh, the power to amend the trust, the power to change the governing law of the trust, the power perhaps to sweep between non grantor and non grantor status, usually by amending it. Veto distributions, force distributions, change the trustee of the trust, right? I mean, all sorts of different powers can be given to the protector, depending on what sort of control we want to retain indirectly. Well, then the next natural question from the client will be, well, uh, what do I do if I have a falling out with the protector? They have all this power over the trust. What's to keep them from like acting in their own self-interest? Well, certainly we will have provisions in the trust agreement preventing the protector from exercising powers for their own benefit or even the benefit of someone perhaps related to the trust protector, if that's appropriate. Um, but what we will most importantly do is we will give the, our client, the settlor of the trust, the power to remove and replace the protector with someone else. And we'll make sure that the client himself, the settlor, cannot be the protector. And it cannot be someone who is subordinate to the settlor. There cannot be any principal agent relationship. We cannot have the powers of the protector be attributed to uh, our client, right? So it can be someone else, a family friend, a relative, a professional protector, right? There are professional protectors out there now. Uh, so it, it's a beautiful evolution in how trusts are being drafted because now we can have a trust that is treated as an irrevocable trust for whatever purpose we need to treat it as such. But we've retained a lot of control over the trust. It's just not control held directly by by our client, by the settlor of the trust. Um, skip the requirements for a valid trust. Um, and let's go straight into some, you know, advanced planning with trusts. Again, always talking about irrevocable trusts. The only time, well, I'll modify. Uh, two, two sets of circumstances when we use a trust that is revocable. We use a trust that is revocable, the so-called living trust or the family trust, for kind of the more routine estate plan, right? To avoid probate, provide how and when assets go to the beneficiaries, to deal with the incapacity, right? Things like that. Uh, and we use a revocable trust when we need something really simple like camouflaging the title of assets. So in some states, that's called a land trust, right? Which is just a, a trust that is revocable, has a generic name, uh, and makes it more difficult for someone to find and connect the property to our client. There's no substantive protection in a trust that's revocable. There's no substantive protection in a land trust. Uh, but it does camouflage title and perhaps make it somewhat more difficult for plaintiffs or prospective plaintiffs to connect real estate to our clients. Every other trust we're talking about, every other type of trust used in kind of more sophisticated planning is always an irrevocable trust. And for most of them, we will use a trust protector to put our client at ease that he has not lost control. So first let's talk about, uh, let's talk about income tax planning. What sort of income tax planning can we do uh, with an irrevocable trust? Um, so over the past few years, there has been an evolution of uh, trusts that are referred to as INGS, uh, Intentional Non-Grantor Trusts. So these are trusts that are established in a state that has no income tax. Let's say Nevada, Wyoming, Delaware. And sometimes you will hear these trusts called uh, NINGS or WINGS or DINGS, right? With the first letter standing in for the name of the state. So NING being a Nevada Incomplete Non-Grantor Trust. And these trusts, are established um, to avoid the state income tax, right? Because so these trusts are structured as non-grantor trusts. What non-grantor means in the income tax world is that the trust is treated as its own taxpayer. It's, it files its own income tax returns, right? It has its own life uh, as a taxpayer. And if you have a trust that its own taxpayer and this trust is in Nevada, then whatever income that trust generates 
is being generated in Nevada. And it's not being generated in New York or in California or some other state that has a, a high income tax rate. And these are trusts that have been around for quite a while. Uh, there is a Supreme Court case on these trusts from a few years ago. Uh, but, the, you know, the, we know how to make them work. There are certain limitations in structuring uh, in some states, uh, like most recently in California. Uh, we have to fund these trusts through a completed gift, right? taxable gift of assets to the trust, whereas previously we were able to make non-taxable gifts into these trusts. But if structured correctly, this trust allows us to position assets outside of a state that has a high income tax. So even ongoing, so either ongoing revenues are not subject to the state income tax or a future realization event like the sale of a company, right, is going to take place when the owner of the asset is in Nevada and the state income tax does not apply. And for some clients, this can be some very, very uh, significant savings, especially when they're selling their businesses uh, for uh, millions of dollars. <clears throat> in estate tax planning, uh, we use uh, trusts a lot as well, uh, much more so than an income tax planning. And in estate tax planning, uh, we use many different types of trusts. So uh, the most popular kind of trusts we've been using in estate tax planning have been uh, defective grantor trusts, or uh, commonly abbrevi abbreviated um, is IGITs, intentionally defective grantor trusts. And sometimes you have to wonder at these names uh, so if you look at the tax code, there is no reference to an intentionally defective grant or trust. Um, this is something that um, uh, happens uh, only, you know, from a marketing standpoint. Uh, trusts, uh, you know, th th these names are just marketing terms that are given to the trusts. Um, so what is an intentionally defective uh, grant or trust? Well, it simply means it's a trust that was intentionally drafted to be a grantor trust. Grantor, again, means, so it's grantor versus non-grantor. And grantor means it was a trust uh, that was drafted um, to be ignored for income tax purposes, right? So if the trust is grantor, it means that whoever set up the trust and funded it continues to be taxed on the income of the trust. And if the trust is non-grantor, and the trust itself is taxed on its income. So in the state tax planning, uh, what, uh, you know, what the objective commonly is, right, is to move the assets um, outside uh, of uh, someone's estate. Uh, so that's number one. The other objective uh, may be to, um, to freeze the value of the estate at whatever the current value is and to prevent the future growth of the taxable estate. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit in the context of estate tax planning, uh, because this is a trust that's, uh, that's used very often in estate tax planning. Let's say that today we have a client that owns uh, uh, a shopping center. You know, It's worth a significant amount of money it has been in the family for many, many years. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we need to minimize the estate tax that will apply to the shopping center. So what we're looking to do is we look to transfer the shopping center uh, out of the client's name and out of his estate. And we're looking to put it into this trust. And this once we put it into this trust, um, it's a, what's called a completed transfer for gift and estate tax purposes. And the client no longer owns the shopping center, meaning that on death, the shopping center will not be included as his asset, right? Because it's now owned by the trust. Well, the beauty of transferring the shopping center into the trust today, what's called a lifetime transfer, is because assets generally over the course of years increase in value. Right? In the meantime, there may be ups and downs, but over the longer term, um, assets increase in value. So the earlier we transfer assets out of our client's estate, the greater the benefit. All of the future appreciation and the value of the assets will take place uh, outside of the client's estate. So let's get the asset now. 
Well, how do we get this $20 million shopping center out of the client's estate and into a trust? Uh, there are only two ways in the tax world. There are only two ways of transferring an asset to another taxpayer. It can be either uh, a sale or it can be a gift. So if we sell an asset to a trust, right? We have the capital gain tax consequences. If we gift the asset to the trust, we have the gift tax consequences. And it may still be a good idea to do that in the long term, right? To minimize the estate tax. But it's very difficult to convince a client to incur significant tax consequences today for a possible benefit to their heirs in the future. So the defective grantor trust was designed as a way to take away the downside. So this is an irrevocable trust. And the transfer of assets to this trust, it's a completed transfer, meaning that the assets will be out of the estate, will not be subject to the estate tax. But how do we get the assets to the trust? So what we're going to do is we are going to sell the assets to the trust for their fair market value. And if we sell the assets to the trust for their fair market value, we knock out the gift tax, right? Because you can only have a gift tax if you're transferring assets for less than fair market value. So with the defective grant or trust, it's going to be a sale for fair market value. So we don't need to worry about the gift tax. Oh, but now we need to worry about the income tax because remember, it's either a gift tax or an income tax on the transfer of assets. Well, what are the income tax consequences of selling an asset, an appreciated asset, let's say $20 million of gain on this asset to a trust? And the answer is, well, it depends. It depends on how this trust is taxed. Because if this trust is taxed as a grantor trust, for income tax purposes, then remember, as a grantor trust, it is ignored. And who is treated as the owner of the trust assets? Well, it's our client, the settlor of the trust. Therefore, for income tax purposes, when the client is selling an asset to his own grantor trust, it is as if he is selling it to himself. And if he is selling it to himself, there are no income tax consequences. So now we have a structure, a transaction, where we are able to transfer a valuable appreciated asset from our name and out of our taxable estate into the hands of the trust. And there are no gift tax consequences and there are no estate tax consequences. So we sell the asset to the trust, usually for a promissory note, right? So the trust gives us a promissory note for $20 million. The trust usually makes payments on the note from the revenues that it's now generating from the shopping center that's inside the trust. So we do get back into our state a $20 million promissory note, and I'm kind of simplifying the transaction, but just to make the math work, right? So on the date of the transaction, the value of our estate hasn't changed. $20 million asset went out, a $20 million asset came back in. Here's the distinction. What we now own in our hands is a promissory note. A promissory note does not increase in value, right? As a matter of fact, it's always decreasing in value as the remaining income stream uh, is being reduced. But the asset in the hands of the trust continues in the long term to appreciate in value. And all of that appreciation has been removed from the estate and will never be subject to the estate tax. So this is a very frequently used um, estate tax planning technique. And it's so popular because there are no tax consequences today. Another technique that used to be very popular and then for many years was not popular is the Qualified Personal Residence Trust. It stopped being popular for a long time because the economics of setting up Cupid's uh, work really well when you have high income tax rates uh, and I'm not going to go through this analysis of Cupid's, but just pointing it out that maybe now that the interest rates are on the rise, Cupid's are looking more attractive, right? And what is looking less attractive are what are called grants, grant to retain the annuity trust. These work beautifully when you have very low interest rates and do not work so well in higher interest rate environments. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. I just kind of want to bring it to your attention. 
These are all types of trusts, right? All we're talking about here, Cupert's Qualified Personal Residence Trusts, uh, Ings Intentional Non-Grantor Trusts, Egypt's Intentional Defective Grantor Trusts, Grads, Grantor Retain Annuity Trusts, right? These are all different types of trusts used in some form of uh, tax planning. And by the way, some of this terminology you will find in the tax code or in the regulations, like grads, and some is just pure marketing terms like ings uh, and agents. <clears throat> Trusts are also one of the cornerstone structures of asset protection planning. So in asset protection planning, what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to protect our assets, what we own, from claims of creditors. And these creditors can be, you know, plaintiffs in a lawsuit. It can be a lender that we owe money to or a landlord. It can be some sort of a government agency that is coming after us. There are many different types of creditors out there. So whoever may come after our assets at some point in time, when they do that, what they will have to do is file a lawsuit, get a judgment against us. And once they have a judgment against us, with that judgment, they can go after pretty much any and every asset that they own, unless somehow the, the asset is exempt. But by and large, anything that you that you own, a creditor can go after. <clears throat> the flip side of the coin is that if there is an asset that you do not own, a creditor cannot take it from you, right? It's not yours. So what every single asset protection structure aims to do is take an asset that you own and make it into an asset that you do not own. Well, that's not difficult to do. Take all of your assets and donate them to the Salvation Army. And you will no longer own them. But that's not really what clients want to do, right? They want to not own the asset just for the purpose, right, uh, of protecting it. They don't really want to part with the asset permanently, right? They want to protect it so they can keep it, not lose it. Trusts are very helpful to accomplish this. When we transfer an asset into a trust, we know into an irrevocable trust, I should, I should uh, clarify. Uh, we no longer own that asset. The asset is now owned by the trustee of the trust, right? The trustee has legal title, as we discussed earlier. Um, the trustee has legal title to the assets of the trust. But if the trust is structured in a clever way, uh, our client can have the ability to regain uh, access to those assets. And he can certainly make uh, changes to the trust. So trusts are, for this reason, right, that allows us to move the asset out of, our, out of our name, but at the same time, retain access and control, maybe unwind the structure at some point in time. Very, very, very popular in estate tax, sorry, in asset protection planning. Uh, and like with income tax planning and estate tax planning, we talked about trusts that have tax consequences, right? When we are engaging in asset protection planning, the trust may have tax consequences. So it could be one of these trusts we talked about for tax planning. But we can also set up an irrevocable trust for asset protection planning that will have no tax consequences, meaning it's a trust that is a grand tour trust for income tax purposes, meaning it's ignored. <clears throat> and the transfer of the assets to the trust is an incomplete gift, meaning it's ignored as a gift. The assets remain in the estate. So transfers of assets in and out of the trust are not taxable. Right, so it would work the same way as a, a living trust would work, a, a revocable living trust. Okay, put the assets in, take assets out, no tax consequences. Um, so, in asset protection planning, uh, every uh, trust has to be an irrevocable trust. If the trust is revocable, creditors can go directly after the assets of a trust that is revocable. So, every asset protection trust has to be irrevocable. Just like the tax planning trust that we've discussed, those have to be irrevocable as well. And, and as I pointed out, that used to be something of concern to all of us, right? It's hard to commit to an irrevocable trust, uh, but nowadays through the proper drafting of the trust, by adding in the concept of a trust protector, uh, we're not so concerned with the fact that the trust is irrevocable. Really it's irrevocable, really irrevocable by third party creditors, but our client re retains the indirect ability to revoke the trust. So to have a good asset protection trust, it must meet three and in most states, four requirements. So it must be irrevocable. 
it must incorporate the spendthrift clause. Spendthrift means uh, there's a provision in the trust that prohibits beneficiaries from being able to assign and anticipate uh, their interest in the trust. Um, and the trust must be um, discretionary. Discretionary, and this is important, discretionary means that the trustee of the trust has discretion in making distributions. So the trustee gets to decide when to make a distribution. The trustee gets to decide how much to distribute, if at all, right? And which beneficiaries to distribute to and which beneficiaries to exclude. And if the trustee has all of these discretions, right? What's called a fully discretionary trust. You, know, you basically say, trustee, you make all the distribution decisions. None of the beneficiaries would have a property right in the trust. They would have what's called the mere expectancy. And that's just not something that anyone can take from you because it's just an expectancy. It's not something you own. Um, so I said in most jurisdictions, there are four requirements. And the fourth requirement is the following. Who is going to be the beneficiary of the trust? Hmm. Who will be the beneficiary of the trust? Well, let's take a look. Um, if you go back uh, to the origins of the English common law relating to trust, you will learn that there is this requirement uh, that provides that if you set up a trust for your own benefit, what's called the self-settled trust, right? For yourself, you've settled it for yourself, self-settled trust. It's a perfectly valid trust, except it does not shield the assets of the trust from the creditors of the settler, right? A self-settled trust does not. You cannot. So th that was the all the English common law. We inherited it, we as a nation, right? And every state had it until 1997, uh, when some states, I believe uh, starting with like Alaska and then followed quickly Delaware, Nevada, Rhode Island, so on and so forth, uh, allow uh, you to set up a trust for your own benefit, right? And it is an effective creditor shield. Well, that sounds wonderful, right? And for those who are still, you know, concerned about the use of irrevocable trust, despite trust protectors and whatnot, what can be better than setting up a trust for your own benefit, right? Worst case scenario, you distribute the assets to yourself, no harm, no foul, right? Uh, and it does sound wonderful, and we do occasionally use these types of trust, but a couple of caveats. First of all, uh, if you have a trust that is to any extent self-settled, even to a tiny extent, meaning you keep just some tiny amount of benefit in the trust for yourself. Then if the settlor, if the settlor of the trust files bankruptcy, there's a 10 year to look back on the transfer of these assets to the trust, right? And the bankruptcy trustee will be able to claw the assets back out of the trust for a period of 10 years. That is a really long, really long statute of limitations. We don't wanna expose our clients to that and it could be malpractice to do so. So very rarely, uh, well, I'll take it back. I never set up self-settled trusts. I just don't. I may set up trusts in Alaska and Delaware and whatnot. I would never set them up as a self-settled trust. Uh, I personally think it uh, comes, comes close to being malpractice, I guess, depending on the client's objectives. Uh, and the other caveat is that very few people live in Alaska, Delaware, and Nevada, and Wyoming, and you know the few other states that have um, enabled legislation allowing self-settled trusts as asset protection tools, <clears throat> right? So most clients live in Texas and California and Florida and New York and Illinois and Pennsylvania, right? That do not have uh, these new laws on self-settled trusts. They have the old English common laws on self-settled trusts. So if you have a client um, in one of these states, let's say I have a client in, in California, and they're being sued in California. Well, California court is going to apply California law. I mean, not 100%, but pretty likely, right? The law we pick in the trust instrument um, is not binding on the third party creditor, similar to the choice of law we make on the, you know, an LLC agreement or in a partnership agreement. It's only binding on the parties to that agreement, never binding on the third party creditor, right? Uh, so that's number one. Number two, <clears throat> If litigation is in California, the California court can say, well, you know, Nevada has this law allowing 
the protection to come from a self-settled trust, but that violates California public policy and not allowing that, right? And California has strong public policy on that. Uh, so we don't have to apply any of that a lot, despite the full faith and credit clause of the constitution. Um, and then, you know, if the trust owns assets, let's say in California, like real estate in California, definitely real estate is gonna be governed uh, by local law under the choice of law analysis. So be very, very careful using these domestic asset protection trusts. They do have their uses. I so certainly do not mind using them. Uh, but I think so many trust companies that are in these jurisdictions market these trusts as some sort of a magic elixir. Uh, you just need to be very cautious. It is not a magic elixir. It has some limited uses, but limited. So let's talk a bit about uh, offshore trusts. And this is one kind of thing I, uh, that always uh, sort of confounded me a bit, uh, really going back to domestic asset protection trusts. You know, with domestic asset protection trusts, and you know, you can read my uh, materials, there are much more details on this. I've written articles on this. Um, I've written books on this. Um, you have the full faith and credit clause of the constitution, for example, uh, various choice of law rules that apply this and that, comedy clauses. Those are applied, right, when the trust is set up within the United States because it's in a sister state. So why risk exposure to these laws that will diminish the protection of a trust? When you can just as easily, for as much money or sometimes even for, for less money, set up a trust in a foreign country and you don't need to worry about the full faith and credit clause of the U.S. Constitution and choice of law analysis and this and that, right? Trust is outside of the United States. The trust company is now outside of the United States, so U.S. court has no jurisdiction over it. If you properly select a trust company, then perhaps you've even moved assets overseas. So now the asset itself is beyond the jurisdiction of U.S. court. If you can do all of those things, like why set up a domestic asset protection trust? Again, there are rare circumstances when that is called for, and certainly there are some clients who under no circumstances would proceed with an offshore uh, asset protection structure. They would not, right? Um, so then maybe, you know, a Nevada trust will be better than a New York state trust. But maybe a foreign trust will be even better. So when do we use uh, foreign trust? So we're looking for foreign countries, first of all that have enacted laws that are favorable to debtors, right? So uh, we want jurisdictions that will not recognize a foreign judgment, usually at least as it pertains to the trust. Uh, so a judge, meaning a judgment from the United States will not be enforced in that, in that country. Um, we want very favorable fraudulent transfer laws. So usually these are jurisdictions that require uh, the proof of a fraudulent transfer beyond uh, a reasonable doubt um, and have a two-year statute of limitations on a fraudulent transfer. Uh, there are all sorts of other provisions built in, like an automatic flight clause, so automatically removing the trust from that jurisdiction to another jurisdiction uh, if there's litigation, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, the jurisdictions that we tend to use I mean, historically, we use the Cook Islands a lot. I was a big fan of the Cook Islands. Um, we stopped using the Cook Islands uh, in a very significant way going back maybe 17, 18 years ago because the Cooks just became too notorious as an asset protection jurisdiction. And often that's a stigma that many of our clients, especially clients who are either politically exposed or have some sort of celebrity status, just do not want. Um, so we use some Caribbean jurisdictions. Uh, we use uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines a lot. We use other uh, other islands. Uh, we use some European countries to locate trust in. Um, you know, there, there are some nice choices out there. But uh, I am a big proponent of using foreign trust only for liquid assets, meaning assets that themselves can be moved outside of the United States. This can be intellectual property as well, right? Because that's an intangible asset. It is always cited. This jurisdiction of ownership is always cited to the jurisdiction of its owner. So if, let's say St. Vincent Trust owns um, intellectual property, 
then it deems, it's deemed to be intellectual property located in St. Vincent, even if, let's say, it's uh, trademarks registered with the USPTO or the European Union or what have you. Um, and, and imagine, let's say, that we have uh, California, Utah, New York, what have you, US-based real estate, uh, and we've placed the ownership of this real estate into a foreign trust. First of all, I think you, from a practical standpoint, just shot yourself in the foot because with the real estate, any further transactions with this real estate, any further transfers or encumbrances in real estate, the owner has to sign a deed and the deed has to be notarized. Well, now the owner is a trust company in some Caribbean country, right? How are you going to get their signature and notarized? Are you going to pay them? to travel to a jurisdiction somewhere, some country in the Caribbean that has a U.S. consulate where there may be a notary, right? That can notarize their signature. Uh, that doesn't seem likely and also very expensive. And second, if the real estate is in the United States, don't you think a U.S. judge will just say, I don't care who owns it. I'm just going to sign a judicial deed and transfer the ownership of this real estate to the plaintiff. So we only use offshore structures. And by the way, the foreign trust is just one of many examples of offshore structures, a common one, but one of many. Um, uh, the judge will just say, you know, I have jurisdiction, doesn't work. So we only use uh, uh, offshore trusts for, um, uh, for liquid assets, right? Where the asset itself is now in Europe in some bank or investment account and beyond the jurisdiction um, of a US court. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, the tax treatment of foreign trusts. Um, it's really more of a tax seminar, but just understand that when, when you do set up really pretty much anything overseas, but certainly a trust, uh, there are uh, reporting requirements that apply to this trust. Um, so um, we have forms 3520 and 3520A that have to be filed for the trust. They're, they so basically tax returns for the trust and they're very significant significant penalties if uh, these uh, forms um, uh, are not filed. Um, all sorts of reporting, uh, pretty much anything you do overseas, certainly bank accounts, investment accounts and the like. Uh, let me uh, kind of address one final topic uh, in the couple of minutes we have remaining and there's no slide in it. So. Uh, just listen, please. Uh, and that's the use of trust in uh, uh, pre-migration tax planning. So these are called uh, drop-off trusts. So let's say we have a, a somewhat wealthy or very wealthy foreign family that is looking to move to the United States, or it could be an entrepreneur that is opening a business in the United States and he's coming here on some sort of a, you know, exceptional visa. Um, once uh, this person or this family are either you know resident in the United States for some period of time, or they obtain a green card or an EB-5 visa, they are now U.S. taxpayers, uh, at least for income tax purposes, maybe not for necessarily for gift in the state, but def definitely for income tax purposes. And the United States has the distinction of being one of those countries that tax on worldwide income. So these people may have assets remaining overseas, uh, you know, income generating assets. Um, and all of a sudden, all of their worldwide income is subject to taxation by the United States. And that's not a very good result. Um, so uh, a lot of planning can be done for these types of, cl of clients. Uh, and, and one of those uh, planning tools is a drop off trust where we would set up a trust uh, prior to immigration, and there are time constraints and so forth that uh, we're not going to get into, but I'm trying to um, explain just the basic concept for now. They would uh, drop off the assets into a trust, right? The trust remains outside of the United States. The assets remain outside of the United States. Um, and if properly structured, the assets of the trust will not be subject to U.S. taxation because it's not an asset of the person who is living here. Right. The trust, remember, is treated as a separate legal person. It's irrevocable and it's not self-settled. And our client does not have in the direct way the ability to make changes to the trust, terminate the trust, what have you, revoke the trust, all through the use of an independent uh, trust protector. 
right? So very, very, very important uh, planning component uh, for those looking to immigrate to the United States. And likewise, trusts are also uh, likewise trusts are also very used for foreigners who invest in the United States. So if a foreigner has significant assets in the United States, and for many foreigners, it's real estate investments, and that person, that foreign person dies, they now have a, a taxable estate in the United States. When a U.S. person dies, a U.S. taxpayer, you know, 12 and a half million of assets is not subject to the estate tax. If you're a foreigner, what's called a non-resident alien, um, I think only like, what is the number? $60,000 of assets uh, in, the Euro, in the U.S. are not subject to the U.S. estate tax. So if you have, let's say, we have uh, lots of Asian clients who buy real estate in the U.S. as an investment for their kids to live in and go to school, what have you. If that parent dies and they own, you know, a million dollar home in the United States, 40% uh, of the value of the home, pretty much 40%, right? Uh, that exemption amount is tiny, is subject to the estate tax. So there's a $400,000 estate tax liability. And the same will apply if there's a business in the United States or, or other investments. So very often the planning that is done for foreign clients is to take their U.S. assets, be it real estate or investments in businesses, uh, and then move those assets into an irrevocable trust. Sometimes this will be a trust based in the United States. Sometimes this will be a trust uh, based overseas. But get it out of their name, right, so that on their debt, they do not have a U.S. estate. They do not directly own assets in the United States. Really important to do. All right, I believe um, this kind of concludes uh, the presentation on this topic. As you would imagine, I mean, this is a very broad topic, but planning with trusts. Um, we sort of sampled a lot of different uh, ideas uh, in using trusts for income tax planning, estate tax planning, asset protection. You know, trusts are also used for special needs planning, which is very similar, special needs planning qualifying for government benefits. It's very similar to asset protection, the idea being that once the asset is placed inside of a trust, our client no longer owns that asset. So that asset is not counted, let's say, against government benefits, if done correctly. Um, we have used these structures for clients who have kids trying to qualify for uh, college financial aid, and parents need to remove not just assets, but income. Uh, from their name. Trust also can be uh, used for that. So many different uses of trust. And then there are so many trusts we haven't covered. Uh, beneficiary defective income trusts, uh, spousal lifetime access trusts, I mean, many, many different ones. And, and then there are these uh, trusts that are purely marketing trusts. Uh, the ones that we've seen uh, often like fortress trusts and bridge trusts. The trusts themselves may be very legitimate and have you know specific uses, and we use these types of trusts. But just be aware of the names. You know, someone came up with a marketing name, marketing term for this trust, and the name itself does not communicate what it is. Right? You do have to review the trust and figure out what is it, how it works, what the benefits are. Uh, so again, I'm Jacob Stein. Uh, I had Allianz uh, private client practice uh, globally. Uh, my own practice focuses on kind of more complex trust and estate planning and asset protection planning. I'm always available to answer questions from anyone who's taken my classes. My email is uh, jstein at alliantlaw.com. You can also just Google uh, my name. Always, always happy to answer questions. And with that, guys, thank you so much for listening to this presentation. And I will see you next time.